How's it going guys? If you followed me for any length of time, you would know that Naruto is my number one favorite anime ever. This is something I've planned to make ever since I started my channel, so the fact that you're seeing it at all is pretty surreal. The more I wrote this project, the more I realized how much I had to say on the topic, and really what I wanted to accomplish in the process. So right here at the start, I think it would be helpful to lay out the three things that I think this project really became. The first is, of course, talking holistically about Naruto in regards to both its strengths, weaknesses, and everything in between. The second is talking about a lot of the misconceptions people have of the series, and in general how people have come to view it. And of course, third and finally, giving my own personal thoughts on the series and what it means to me. For the purpose of this series, Boruto does not exist. I honestly have really come to enjoy Boruto, but not only because it was penned by a different author for a lot of time, but it's also not even finished yet, and in many ways it's very much its own thing. So I'm basically choosing to ignore it in favor of talking about Naruto as a single cohesive product. In an attempt to give this video some sort of structure, I'll be tackling the series one arc at a time. Rather than just repeat everything that happened, I'll be using the events of each arc to speak more broadly about the series and then I'll deviate to cover bigger topics here and there when I feel it's necessary. And of course, because there's so much material to cover, this project will be split into three parts. This part will cover part one of the Naruto manga, or the first series. This means that there are some plot elements that people may have an issue with, but what they really have an issue with is events that happen later on, so we'll deal with those when we get there. And remember, even though this is a video about the first series, I will definitely be touching on events that happen in Shippuden and all the way to the end of the series. This is not a recap. This is not spoiler free in any way. However, that means that this is all going to be pretty long because I'm going to be saying everything I have to say on the series. So there are timestamps in the description. So without further ado, summon your shadow clones, grab a snack and get comfortable because here is a full retrospective on the Naruto series. The Land of Waves sets up everything the series would be about. Even though the series grew to have a huge cast, the power levels became insane, and the plot went in directions many people didn't expect, I think that the core of what makes Naruto, Naruto never changed, and we'll see that as we go forward. At this point, you'll just have to take me at my word, and wait till I show it throughout the series, but Naruto is a story about a war-torn and pain-filled world. It's a story where everyone is burdened by their past and the depression that the world around them brings. However, one boy was able to break through that pain and use it as a means to feel supernatural empathy to those around him. That boy is Naruto, and The Land of Waves shows us many of these themes in small scale. But before we even get into the story at all, I think I ought to mention how great the manga is on a technical basis. Right from the start, the introduction is so much fun. Kishimoto's original artwork has some of the most fun and energetic paneling I've read in a shonen manga. He has a way of balancing detail and simplicity in order to make everything incredibly clear. Whereas a lot of manga artists try to shove in as much detail as they can into every panel, Kishimoto focuses instead on having clarity and motion taking center stage. His grasp on expression and gesture is off the charts. I mean, just look at these panels. Look how well they flow and how fun they make the ninja world feel. The entire world has this sense of rhythm and energy. This is coupled with his creative posing and expressions. A lot of manga will prioritize their characters looking cool in every panel, but Kishimoto's willingness to push the boundary in the faces makes it a joy to read. I'm not saying that he goes as far in selling the expressions as someone like Oda does, but he does it just enough to keep the energy and liveliness of the environment to take place in. Kishimoto actually gave up drawing for a number of years to pursue his interest in baseball. It wasn't until he saw the iconic poster for the movie Akira that he got back into it, and I think the inspiration is clear. It's rare to see poses and framing this intriguing in manga. He often utilizes this fisheye lens in his color spreads which is incredibly unique and further cements the feel of the ninja world. This feeling is what makes it so inherently exciting to read. Everything from the architecture to the designs to the technology feeds into the overall experience of being in this world. I'll also add that in these first couple chapters, the Okage has this crystal ball that doesn't really come back, and I think with things like this, you can tell that Kishimoto was still throwing around a bunch of ideas at the world and just seeing what sticks. I would never want to punish a mangaka for trying new things and getting creative. And to be honest, when the end product is this good and this fun, that's alright with me. 
This is taken even further by the anime adaptation, but we'll get to that in a moment. Just like real life, the ninja world has its own landmarks, political structure, and mistakes that make it truly feel lived in. I think this can be no better illustrated by the Hokage Rock and Final Valley Monuments. Seeing structures like this emphasize that these characters are just a small part in a big world with rich history. And this is where the actual story starts. Naruto is one of the best first episodes ever, especially among long-running series. One thing that I think many people overlook is just how hated Naruto was by the village. He was totally alone, aside from Iruka. No family, no strong bonds, no one to acknowledge him, which perfectly leads into his dream of being the Hokage. Unlike a lot of these shonen dreams, the Hokage is not the strongest. I mean, yeah, most of the time the Hokage ends up being the strongest ninja in the village, but it's not at all a requirement. If we're being honest, Guy is probably stronger than nearly every Hokage anyways, but that's beside the point. The Hokage is essentially an elected official. The reason why Naruto wants to be Hokage is because a position like that is proof that he's well-loved and respected by everyone in the village. Does Naruto fully understand that at this point in the story? No. Does his understanding of his own dream develop as the story goes on? Yes, and it's one of my favorite aspects about his character, so we'll definitely keep track of that as we go forward. But regardless, this section sets up Naruto as the ultimate underdog, because he couldn't be further from his goal. Naruto wants to be someone who's loved and acknowledged by everyone, and he starts out the story being a complete outcast, with many people even wanting him dead. Oh, and fun fact, the anime has a plot hole here, where Naruto makes a clone before he actually should know how to, but that's just in the anime, it's not in the manga. But as we know, Naruto does eventually learn, and he joins up with Team 7. Oftentimes, when introducing a new cast of main characters, it can be somewhat of a challenging task for the author to give us the gist of their personality and goals without it feeling clunky. That's why I think Kishimoto was really smart to frame it as an introduction within the world itself. I mean, Kakashi straight up asked them to introduce their motivations to him and to us, the viewer. Naruto is a very simple person who just goes on about ramen. However, within that simple person is an incredibly lofty goal. Sasuke, on the other hand, speaks in poignant, carefully worded sentences, and speaks of his goal to kill a certain someone. And then of course Sakura speaks about liking Sasuke and hating Naruto. These introductions give us a great amount of insight into how their character arcs will play out. Naruto is idealistic, Sasuke is realistic, and Sakura cares about how she stands in relationship with other people. These character traits are also reinforced in the iconic Bell Test. Naruto rushes in without even thinking about it. Sakura is the one most susceptible to illusionary tricks, and Sasuke prioritizes tactics and strategy. The only other thing I have to say about the Bell Test is that the characterization of Kakashi here is amazing. Everything up to this has been pretty lighthearted in tone, and Kakashi is too, but it's really clear that it's just a front. When Kakashi says, those who break the ninja rules are scum, but those who abandon their friends are worse than scum, you can just tell he means it for some reason deeper than we understand. And early Naruto does this a lot, actually. There are a whole bunch of times when Kakashi says stuff or does stuff that hint at a much sadder side to the character than the jovial and laid-back guy we've been presented with. Of course, the prologue also offers some great characterization for the other characters, but the first real arc of the series, The Land of Waves, does this all even better. While the plot of The Land of Waves isn't anything remarkable, I think it's a pretty good introduction to the series. Like I said earlier, I think that it's simple for a reason, so it can focus on all the major elements of the Naruto series in small scale. And the arc really is small scale. It's not about the fate of the Leaf Village or the world or anything like that. In fact, basically none of these characters or events have a large impact on the story at large like the rest of the arcs do. There are a few callbacks to this arc later on, but any direct connections are sparse. It's just a little story about a bridge and the struggle to have it built. Team 7 is just kind of thrust into this situation, and I would say that the resulting arc can be split up into three major parts, each revealing one thing that would later become an emphasis of the series as a whole. Those three things are the fight against Zabuza and Haku, Naruto and Sasuke training together, and Inari's story about him and his father Kaiza. Each one of these little sections shows a foundational part of the Naruto series. Action that's both hype and heartfelt, the developing relationship of Naruto and Sasuke, and Naruto's goal to be the Hokage. 
Each one of these pillars feeds into each other, but I think that when you boil down Naruto into its most basic elements, these are what you would find. Naruto's relationship with Sasuke is fairly obvious, so I won't spend too much time on it here, but a lot of the Land of Waves is dedicated to the idea that Naruto is good, Sasuke is good, but they are both at their best when paired together. These two are the exact same, but they are also complete opposites of each other. They have a legitimately believable rivalry, friendship that just begins to blossom in these scenes. Here also Sakura gets to shine as she easily bests Naruto and Sasuke at wall climbing, which I think is pretty fun. Inri's story with his father is concise but effective. It's just a little boy who's lost all hope in this world, and then, through his actions, Naruto gains his respect. Like I said earlier, the Hokage is the person who has gained the respect of everyone in the village. So before we get to the entire village, we need to work our way up to that. So starting Naruto off with him gaining the acknowledgement of some random village boy is a good starting point. Before Naruto is the hero of the world, he becomes the hero of Inari, and that's pretty neat. And finally, the biggest plotline in the Land of Waves is Zabuza and Haku. The villains of Naruto were far more human than in many other series. Please don't confuse what I'm saying. I don't think that purely evil villains are poorly written villains. There are plenty of villains I thoroughly enjoy that are unwaveringly evil, but in the case of Naruto, they were always incredibly layered. During the fight against Zabuza, Sakura reveals that ninjas are literally trained to suppress their emotions. No wonder so many of the Naruto characters are burdened and depressed. The Land of Waves introduces the theme of ninja being nothing more than tools, used by higher powers for their own purposes. Haku is a great foil to Naruto. They both had very similar childhoods, but different answers. They both grew up sad, lonely, and alone, with one person showing them kindness. Haku believed showing kindness to others, namely your enemies, was a weakness. But Naruto, as we know, turned that pain into empathy. He would become someone that would show kindness to even the worst, most vile enemies he would face. Having Naruto's first real opponent stand in such direct contrast to him serves as a great anti-theme that will stick in our minds for the rest of the series. Likewise, Kakashi's first real opponent shows us what it means to be a leader and someone people can look up to. Zabuza is a demon of a man, someone who's unflinching even when his only friend dies before him. And again, this is a perfect contrast to Kakashi telling the Genin that no matter what, he will never let them die. Another statement that we can tell Kakashi knows all too well at a personal level. But even though Zabuza is this giant, unfeeling monster, Naruto is able to break through the cracks, our first hint at talk no jutsu that would come to define the series. Zabuza has a quote here that I feel perfectly describes nearly every villain of the series. Say what we will. Do what we will. In the end, we shinobi are still just people, after all, with feelings all too human. Zabuza was someone who took advantage of people and was himself taken advantage of. But no matter what kind of persona he put up, in his heart he truly cared for Haku and Naruto was able to expose that. Again, Tognojutsu ends up becoming perhaps the defining feature of this series, and so as we move forward, we'll track its progression, leading up to its ultimate usage in the Fourth Great Ninja War. But planting the seeds of its place in the story so early on was a really smart move. And of course, I have to acknowledge the original hype moment of the series. Sasuke's sacrifice with his iconic line and Naruto tapping into the Ninetales chakra will forever be stuck into my mind. It's good to know that I haven't changed all too much because when I was a kid, and when I reread the series, I lost my mind at this scene. I will also acknowledge that Sakura legitimately does nothing during this entire fight. Her only job is to protect Tazuna, but the moment when he's in danger, it's Kakashi that has to step in to help. Don't worry, Sakura fans, once we get into Shippuden, I'll have a lot more to say in her defense, so just hang on till then. I understand that this is the start of her character arc, but it's still pretty boring to see her just stand around on the bridge while everyone else did stuff. I think that overall the Land of Waves served as a great introduction to not only the world and themes of Naruto, but also the tone. There's a layer of fun and excitement to be found, but it only acts as a front for a world populated with sad characters. And to me that's the most important part. The world of Naruto isn't just dark. It's sad. 
and there's a big difference there, which I'll be discussing in a later arc. At the beginning of the Chunin exams, we double down on all the relationships that were established last arc. Naruto and Sasuke are bickering like brothers, and Sakura herself acknowledges that she is the weakest member of the cell. For the time being, it seems like it's back to normal, until Kishimoto absolutely slams us with new characters. These are some of the absolute strongest and most recognizable designs I've ever seen. Literally every one of these guys are iconic. Part of what I love about these designs is just how kid-like they really feel. As in, I've seen a lot of designs for kids that look like this, but the designs and proportions in Naruto really make them feel like actual children. It's really interesting to see how much Naruto borrowed from the masters before it and how much it added on its own. His designs and posing are often so good that they can sort of speak for themselves in terms of introductions. I mean, who can forget the first time you saw Gara standing here upside down, or Guy pulling up looking like this? And as long as we're talking about the king, and since part of why I'm doing this is to clear up these kinds of things, Guy can use ninjutsu. It's not anything major, but it is a common misconception I see tossed around. I'm not quite sure why people forget this, but I have seen a lot of people say that Guy walking on water or things like that is a plot hole. I mean, I don't really know any way to refute this, except by just showing that it's wrong. Lee, on the other hand, can't use it at all. Guy chose to specialize in taijutsu just like his father Dai, whereas Lee has to specialize in it because he cannot use ninjutsu at all. And again, I've seen some people point to this as some kind of plot hole saying, why was Lee able to pass the ninja exam if he can't even make a shadow clone? I mean, yeah, the Lee village is hard on kids, but this assumes that the village is straight up unwaveringly ableist. Lee is maybe the most hardworking ninja in the village, but he literally has a disability. I'm sure they would have come up with some other test he could take to get him to pass, not to mention that the teachers would know that it is possible to be a ninja without using ninjutsu. The proof is right there in front of them. I've also seen a number of people ask why the Chunin exams are super hard and dangerous when people like Iruka, who have shown zero actual ability in combat, are Chunin. And on the one hand, I kind of agree. The rankings can seem pretty nonsensical at times, like Ibisu is a Chonin? But I think the answer to this specifically is revealed during the exams themselves. In recent years, the Chunin exams have become far more political. They're a way of warring nations against one another in small scale. So rather than promoting people to tune in because of an actual war, the tune in exams themselves are the war, meaning that it's far more strenuous to compete and rank up. So while that may be a canon explanation, part of it is realistically just to make the exams more exciting for the viewer. And I know I'm not doing anything groundbreaking by saying that the exams are freaking awesome, but they just are. In the written portion of the exam, Sakura gets another chance to shine as she is the only one of the main three who's actually able to answer the questions. As opposed to Sasuke who cheats, and Naruto who doesn't get any of them right at all. This test is a great way to hint at the newcomer's full abilities and personalities. Like how Gara is willing to blind someone, or how Hinata is just willing to give up her answers to Naruto. Also, I hate to burden you with this, but Shikamaru here looks exactly like Colt from Hunter x Hunter. Do with that what you will. Kishimoto has this technique he often uses, which for lack of a better term, I'll just call the cutaway. During a particularly intense scene, he'll cut away from it to a scene that gives us additional context to what's happening in a way that makes it even more intense. Two examples here are during the bell test we cut away to find out Kakashi has never passed anyone, and during this scene we cut away to find out Ibiki is the torture specialist of the village. Using this technique allows Kishimoto to bolster the current tension of a scene while still making everything flow pretty tastefully. And once we move into the force of death, the test obviously becomes a lot more intense, at least physically. And uh, 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 <clears throat> uh. One small character moment that often gets overshadowed by this epic Naruto moment is Sasuke's first encounter with Orochimaru. The Sasuke we've come to know is confident to a fault. He never backs down from his peers, but at this moment, in the face of an older figure with overwhelming power, he completely backs down. I wonder if this is trying to hint at how he felt during another critical moment of his life. And as long as we're talking about him, the Forest of Death is our first look at the main villain of Part 1, Orochimaru. And he is freaking terrifying. We've seen people transform and make clones of themselves, but seeing someone contort their body like this and peel off their skin is just so gross, 
and does a lot to convey how great of a villain he's going to be. And of course, after the Orochimaru encounter, we get our next pivotal Sakura moment. When Naruto and Sasuke goes down, she doesn't cower in fear. She sets traps and stabilizes Naruto and Sasuke, and then goes on to fight alongside Lee to defend them. This is her first step in her progression as a character. In the moment she cuts her hair, she says, I'd always thought of myself as a full-fledged ninja, proud to be an equal, as I trailed after my teammates, crushing on Sasuke and scolding Naruto, watching them safely from the background, while they would both risk anything to protect me. Lee says he likes me too, and he risked his life to come between me and danger. You're all my teachers, and you've shown me what I want to be. Like you, all of you. Now it's your turn to watch my back. Her little speech here is vital to remember for the direction she goes in, and it develops in a surprising way. And very soon after this, she gets another moment to shine as she is the one to snap Sasuke out of his rage after he wakes up with the curse mark. The entire section does such a good job at expanding the scope of what will encompass the ninja world for the rest of part one. While our characters are taking their exams, they're obviously completely oblivious to the much grander threat that is being built around them. They understand that Orochimaru is pretty strange and definitely an unsavory character, but the idea that he is plotting and executing a plan to topple the entire village right beside them is going completely over their heads. It's cool to see the higher-ups and runners of the exam try to tackle the larger threat while still allowing the characters to participate in the exams nonetheless. Even we as the audience don't fully understand the gravity of the situation. Who is this Orochimaru, and what kind of ties does he have to the village and the other characters? We're along for the ride just like the characters are. This takes it from just a tournament arc to a near-political thriller unraveling in the background, and it's part of why I think so many people have come to love this arc over the years. All that being said, the first few moments of the Forest of Death are basically just non-stop greatness, but I feel it sort of lulls toward the end. I mean, the Kabuto reveal is great, but after dealing with Orochimaru and his goons, it feels like this last fight was just kind of tacked on at the end to make things more difficult. Luckily, it's pretty short. Another thing I want to add is that even though I just praise the Orochimaru conspiracy plot, it definitely suffers from a bit of the this stand user could be anyone syndrome. I mean, like, they know exactly what Orochimaru looks like, and he's not doing a very good job of hiding himself. Hey, look, look behind you! He's, he's wearing the headband of his own village! He's standing right behind you! He's right there! As any great battle shounen story should, Naruto, of course, had to have a 1v1 section for the tournament. This is such a great time to really showcase all of our new characters' abilities and give them some time to shine individually. We saw most of the characters' abilities during the forest, but the opportunity to show them in their full potential against each other is something Kishimoto took full advantage of. I mean, who can forget the moment that Konkuro had his neck broken only to reveal himself to be a puppet, or Shino... Uh, maybe I do want to forget that one. Something else that I think makes these fights engaging is how brief they are. In the manga, most of them are only like half a chapter. Part of what makes them so great is the ebb and flow of them even though they're so short. It's clear at any point of the fight who's winning and who's losing, which makes a lot of the surprising winners all the more potent. This is also why I would say Sakura vs. Ino is the worst of them. Rather than a back and forth like I was talking about, it's mostly dialogue and flashbacks, which isn't a bad thing per se, but since the actual content of the battle isn't nearly as engaging as the others, it makes the flashbacks seem far more boring than they should be. I also think that this battle feels a lot longer than it actually is, because even though it's not that long compared to these battles, it's several times longer than all the ones that came before it. Its placement in these 1v1s does not serve its content any favors. To contrast this battle with another that plays out somewhat similarly, Hinata vs Neji is another example of a battle that takes place nearly entirely through dialogue. However, this still feels intense because rather than just being a flashback, it consists of Neji attempting to mentally overpower Hinata completely. In other words, this is all part of the battle itself. So when we get the outburst of violence at the end, it all feels like one cohesive thing. Another thing I want to talk about here is Akamaru. I've never really thought about it before, but like, why is Akamaru just a normal dog, but Pakun is like a fully sentient dog that can talk and everything? Why no love for my boy Akamaru? 
But the last thing I want to mention in regards to these 1v1s is how surprising many of them were. I mean, from the very first moments of the arc, a conflict between Sasuke and Gara had been brewing, and so naturally we would expect Sasuke and Gara to fight here. Or maybe Sasuke and Neji, which was another conflict that had been potentially set up. But instead, Sasuke fights this random guy, and then the sign shows that it's actually going to be Rock Lee fighting Gara. I love this moment because it's one of those matchups you never expected, but at the same time you always wanted. This total mystery of a kid versus perhaps the most dangerous killer in the series yet. And this next point I'm going to hand off to a friend. Yo, what's up? t Bry here. So, I've been asked to briefly speak on the Rock Lee versus Gara fight, and I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, but I could talk about this fight for hours. Rock Lee versus Gara is probably one of the most iconic fights in the series, possibly even one of the most iconic fights in Shonen. It's not very often that this fight isn't on people's list of favorite fights when discussing Naruto. And that's for good reason. This fight sort of captures everything we like to see in a battle shonen. Rock Lee is introduced to us as this underdog kid. He's clearly got some skill, but he has no ninjutsu. He uses solely taijutsu to fight, and on top of that, he isn't the coolest looking guy. Rock Lee here was set up in such a way that we would never expect the fight we were about to witness. And he's been put up against Gara, this evil, unstoppable force who didn't get so much as a scratch on him so far in the exams because of this insanely powerful jutsu he has. Gara was terrifying, and Rock Lee being not even one of the main characters, with no ninjutsu and kind of a silly personality, seemed like he was being set up to fail. Gara and Rock Lee are almost exact opposites of each other here, which is what makes this matchup so satisfying. At first, the fight goes just as the audience expects. Rock Lee is attempting to hit Gara, but the sand is stopping him, and it seems futile. Rock Lee then retreats to the top of a statue, and one of the best moments in anime history happens. Guy Sensei yells to Rock Lee, All right, Lee. Take him off. Rock Lee reveals a pair of leg weights around his ankles, and immediately everyone watching is kind of scoffing at it. Like, really? Leg weights? That's his big reveal? Does he really think he can get through Gara's ultimate defense just by dropping a few pounds? But then he drops the weights from the statue to the ground, and they hit the ground with tremendous impact, implying that these weights were ridiculously heavy. I'm talking these things break the ground like two bombs just went off. And everyone in the audience is in shock, including us as the viewers. Suddenly Rock Lee is moving so fast that you can barely keep track of him, and this goofy kid, who everyone doubted with no ninjutsu whatsoever, does what nobody else was able to do. He lands a hit on Gara, And just like that, we all fell in love with Rock Lee. But as the fight goes on, we realize that it's not going to be that easy. Gara has a sand shield coating his skin as well, forcing Gara to use the Forbidden Lotus, damaging himself in the process, and the fight again starts to feel hopeless for Rock Lee. He's getting beaten to a pulp, but he doesn't give up. And the theme of the fight quickly and very clearly becomes hard work and perseverance. We are told the heartbreaking yet inspiring story of Rock Lee and how he never gave up on becoming a ninja despite not having any talent whatsoever. We are introduced to this idea of hard work versus natural talent. And as an audience, we are really able to get behind Rock Lee while watching this fight. We believe in him and we want to see him succeed. And I think it's because it's so easy for us as human beings to see ourselves in Rock Lee in one way or another. There are times in everyone's life where we have felt as though we drew the short straw, where we felt inadequate, or that we just didn't have the talent to do something as well as those who are more fortunate can. And Rock Lee sort of embodies this underdog that we have in all of us, whereas Gara represents whatever challenges we have to overcome. Rock Lee, against all odds in this fight, is trying to prove that just because he can't use ninjutsu, just because he wasn't born gifted like so many other shinobi, doesn't mean that he can't be a splendid shinobi himself through hard work alone. And I think this easily makes him one of the most inspiring characters in the series, and this fight one of the most inspiring to watch by extension. Rock Lee's next 
next amazing moment of course comes when he opens five of the eight gates and gains a tremendous amount of power again shocking the spectators in the anime and shocking us as viewers rock lee seems to be full of surprises for a kid with no ninjutsu he definitely gave us one hell of a show and of course i could go into even more detail about all the amazing moments in this fight but you already know at the end of the fight, he does end up losing to Gara, which would seemingly prove him wrong about hard work beating natural talent, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think what's more important is that this fight showcased how someone who had nothing was able to work hard enough to push Gara, the strongest participant in the Chunin exams outside of maybe Naruto, almost to his limits. He pushed Gara farther than anyone in his life was ever able to do up until that point. Rock Lee, despite losing, proves himself to be just as splendid a shinobi as anyone else, if not more so considering he can't even use ninjutsu and he did all that to Gara. It was truly an amazing thing to witness. And even after Gara crushes his leg and arm and the match is called, Rock Lee still stands up, unconscious, dripping in blood, and takes up a fighting stance. Still Still determined to prove himself. He may have lost the fight, but he undoubtedly won the hearts of Naruto fans everywhere that day. This fight was just a masterclass in inspiration, hype moments, and telling a powerful story through combat. I honestly can't praise it enough, nor do I feel like I can do it the justice it deserves in the time that I have here, but I'll leave it at that. The tune-in exams would lead you to believe that Naruto as a series was going to be about stealth, assassinations, and reconnaissance missions. It's teaching the characters valuable lessons that they'll use as the series moves on. How to keep your mouth shut, how to bottle up your emotions, how to shut up and execute orders. But the thing is, that's not really what we get. Naruto is a series about big battles and lofty goals. Even when they go on missions, I wouldn't really call them stealthy. So why spend all this time establishing these principles in the series? I think it's a backdrop into the world. Naruto isn't about following the rules, it's about changing them. And all these principles that the ninja abided by created a world populated by sad and lonely people. All of these characters are flawed and broken. The reason we spend so much time learning how things work in the ninja world is so we understand why everyone feels the way they do. When Payne speaks about the cycle of hatred in Shippuden, it means something because we see the culture that created it. Characters like Kakashi, Itachi, Danzo, Nagato, Jiraiya, Zabuza, or Obito would be impossible to understand without the foundation of these first arcs. Jiraiya's introduction into the story is one of my favorites. It very clearly displays a concept that is common in a majority of the cast, which I've come to call the persona versus the character, but I guess you could just call it layered writing. I could use any number of characters to show this, but I'll use Jiraiya because he's one of my personal favorite characters. Characters in Naruto often have a sort of dual nature. They're often far more serious and introspective than the walls they put up would allow you to believe. And a large amount of the characters' arcs are them putting down the walls and allowing themselves to confront the demons present in their lives. And spoiler alert, Naruto is often the key that makes these walls come down. For Jiraiya, we see on the outside a pervy old man, but on the inside he is a legitimately serious ninja, trying to find some meaning after a lifetime of failures. Another thing that Kishimoto will often do when introducing a character is something I call associative strength. This isn't something unique to Naruto at all, but many times when a new character is being brought into the story, we will get another character of reference so that we know where to mentally place them in terms of power. When Jiraiya gets introduced, we learn he was in the same cell as Orochimaru. When Gai is introduced, it's said that he's the rival of Kakashi. When the Akatsuki are introduced, we find out Orochimaru was in their ranks. And this is a really stylish way to fit each character into the world without wasting any screen time. And as Naruto trains with Jiraiya, his knowledge of ninjutsu and the overall world is proven to us. He seems to even know more about the Ninetale Fox than we the viewer have ever been presented with. A clever trick that I think Kishimoto pulled off in this section is what Naruto was actually training for. We spend this whole time learning summoning jutsu, but Naruto doesn't even use it at all during his fight with Neji. And that's because what he really learned was how to access Kurama's chakra, which is what allowed him to win. And then he uses the summoning jutsu in his fight with Gara later on. When Naruto first speaks with Kurama during the summoning training, Kurama tells him that if Naruto dies, he will die as well. 
I've heard various ways to spin this where it still lines up with later knowledge, but if I'm being honest, this was definitely retconned later. Far into Shippuden, we get an explicit example of a Jinjuriki being killed and then the tailed beast coming back to life afterward. I guess you could say that technically if Naruto dies, Kurama will die and then come back, but in the context of the scene and the way they were talking, you can tell this is not what Kurama was getting at. Something pretty subtle that I really like here is when Naruto gets back from his training, we already see him having closer relations with the other kids. Whereas before he had nobody, after interacting with them during the tuning exams, he's much closer to the other rookies. It's a nice unspoken progression in Naruto's relationships. Of course, the context of his return wouldn't really allow for it to be spoken. This is the first real conversation about what a Jinjuriki is. Speaking about it so plainly while still not revealing the true nature of the Jinjuriki and Bijou is pretty awesome. But placing this scene more or less directly after the first scene where Naruto speaks to Kurama was really smart on the part of Kishimoto. Contrasting Gara's childhood to Naruto's makes it hit too close to home. I mean, yeah, he is a complete maniac that's legitimately terrifying, but he is just a child, someone born out of hatred and death. His motivations are all too easy to understand and sympathize with. Naruto vs Neji has always been one of my favorite fights in the series. I always appreciate when a narrative is woven through fights that make it more than just an exchange of fists. Neji was obsessed with his destiny and the fate that would control him, whereas Naruto was someone who absolutely throws destiny and fate aside in order to pursue his own ending. Now I know what you're thinking. Alex, is that really all you have to say about the Naruto vs Neji fight? And well, yeah. I've never really seen anyone who has a problem with this fight. It's really well constructed, it's got some great choreography, and it's got a great message. By all accounts, it's a great fight. What people have an issue with is the supposed contradiction that happens during the Fourth Great Ninja War. But since that is a Ninja War topic, we'll get to that when we talk about the Ninja War. Believe me, that's a whole can of worms. I don't have much to say in regards to the other matches for the sake of time, but finally Sasuke and Kakashi make their epic entrance and- w wait, what? I also really don't have too much to say about Sasuke vs Gara, but I will say that oh my gosh, Shidori is one of the coolest abilities ever. But regardless, as we know, the Sand Ninja execute their plan to invade the village. I've always loved how chaotic this section is. There's just stuff happening everywhere. Giant snakes, sleeping genjutsu, assassinations, and it all centers around the fight between the Hokage and Orochimaru. As I said earlier, Orochimaru was a pretty horrifying villain, but oh my gosh does Kishimoto double down on it here. Orochimaru pulling off his skin here is something burned into my mind forever. He has believable motivations, a great design, and some pretty cool abilities. Overall, I think Orochimaru is a great villain for part 1 of Naruto. Specifically, one of the reasons why is his relationship with Naruto himself, being that there is none. Orochimaru never sits around twirling his mustache thinking about how he can thwart Naruto. No, Naruto barely knows him, and he is defeated by the Hokage. Even though Orochimaru is the big bad of the first series, Naruto gets to fight against a secondary villain, Gara. This adds to the realism of the world and the relationships between the characters. That being said, this battle does bring up a pretty big question. How was Hiruzen able to fight both the first and second Hokage? The Hokage being summoned is a topic that many people have discussed over the years, not only for the power levels, but also because of Orochimaru's attempt to summon Minato, who we know was summoned with the Reaper Death Seal. This one I can technically brush aside because, you know, he didn't actually summon him, but it definitely makes you wonder if Kishimoto had the details of Minato's death planned out this early. That being said, Kishimoto did leave it a mystery as to why Minato wasn't able to be resurrected. And on top of that, the third refers to the Reaper Death Seal as the fourth Hokage's Jutsu, and explains it's what he used to seal the Ninetale Fox, so maybe it was more planned out than we give him credit for. But the big question is, like I said, fighting against the first and second Hokage. I think that realistically, Kishimoto probably didn't plan for Hashirama to be as strong as he ended up being, but I would also say that the fight is greatly exaggerated by the critics. You have to remember that Orochimaru was basically toying with the third Hokage for most of the fight. 
It was a deeply personal battle, and he didn't just want to kill Hiruzen, he wanted to torment him about his decisions before the end. That's why he summoned the other Hokage to begin with, so he would be forced to attack his former masters. And Hiruzen did basically get beat around for the entire fight. It's not like he was the equal of the two of them at all. They greatly overpowered him, as they should. The only reason he was able to defeat them was getting a lucky grab on them with the Jutsu Orochimaru didn't even know about. And that makes sense considering the Kage were shown to just stand there and let themselves get hit Kenpachi style because they'll recover from any wounds. So if you want to argue that the third Okage was so much weaker than them, he shouldn't have been able to even get a single hit on them even though they were letting themselves get hit, I guess go ahead, but I would put a little more respect on the famed god of Shinobi. There is also one more topic when it comes to the third Hokage, but I'll get back to that in just a minute. Gara's backstory is one of the most meaningful in the series. The message of love healing wounds from the heart speaks volumes to the themes of the series as a whole. Gara works as a villain because he is Naruto. If Iruka would have betrayed him back then, this is what could have happened to him. Haku was similar to Naruto, but Gara takes that to the next level. He is the dark representation of what could have been, a reflection through a broken mirror. Naruto knew exactly what Gara needed because it was what he needed. Because of his past, Naruto was given supernatural empathy which allowed him to understand Gara fundamentally, even if he didn't know the specifics of what happened to him. Gara fought only for himself and Naruto fought not only to protect those he had come to call his friends, but also to save the lonely child trapped inside the demon before him. That's why this scene never fails to make me cry. Naruto is willing to crawl even on his chin to protect those who pulled him from the pit of darkness, and his actions and words were powerful enough to change even the heart of a monster like Gara. It's simple, it's profound, it's greatness, and it's scenes like this that have stuck with me even years later. By the end of the third Hokage's long battle with Orochimaru, Upon his death, he repeats a sentiment about him viewing everyone in the village, including Naruto, as his family. And this brings up a topic I've seen many people mention. Why didn't the third Okage treat Naruto better? I'll tackle this in two parts. Part one is the specifics. The scene where Kushina asks Hiruzen to take care of Naruto is unfortunately filler. However, he did make sure that Naruto had provisions and a place to stay. The reason why he didn't get anything beyond that is that the whole point was not to give him special treatment so that the other nations wouldn't figure out who the Leaf Village's Jinjuriki was. I mean, this is proven in the series itself because there are people actively hunting Naruto later on for the Fox Spirit. And as far as other people ostracizing Naruto goes, I'm trying to imagine a scene where like the third Okage walks up to the Ninja Academy, like a parent talking to their kid's bully, saying something like, Hey all you kids, you gotta start playing with Naruto. Even though the reason the children hated Naruto is because their parents hated him. Pain and hatred are a cycle. Not to mention that basically all Jinjurikis are hated by their villages. Naruto's not unique in that. Hiruzen's problem wasn't one of contemptment, but one of apathy. Hiruzen's the type of character who rarely ever acted, but rather he reacted. He often sat by while things happened around him even if he disagreed with them. And on the other hand, he was definitely not a perfect individual. He understood the sacrifices and hardships that come with being a village essentially in constant war. I actually think it's pretty jarring in general how on the one hand, Hiruzen will willingly host a death tournament, and on the other hand be somewhat of a loving father. Hiruzen knew it would be Minato's wish that Naruto would be known as a hero for the sacrifice in becoming a Jinjuriki, but the people of the village chose not to view it that way. This is a major theme in Naruto. Empathy is a choice, one we all have to make. Hiruzen thought he was doing well by Naruto, but he was ignorant to the reality of the situation, and what kind of future his apathy could have brought. Hiruzen was a harsh cutthroat person, but he can also be someone that truly loves everyone in the village. These things can both be true. Our perceptions, even of ourselves and our actions, don't always necessarily line up with reality. So did Hiruzen give Naruto an ideal childhood? Well, obviously not. Was it intentional? No. But is inaction just as bad as contempt? Maybe it is. I'll let you be the judge. 
these characters not taking care of Naruto isn't some kind of plot hole, it's characterization. Also, why are we focusing on Naruto? There are tons of orphans in the Leaf Village. Like tons! Iruka, Sasuke, Kakashi, Gai, Obito are just a few examples. The ninja world is a place that is constantly in and out of war, not to mention the nine-tailed fox attack that killed many people. Providing orphans with a fairly basic place to stay, and then having them basically raise themselves is just kinda how the ninja world operates. Singling out Naruto as this special orphan would directly go against the goal of hiding the Jinjuriki in plain sight. However, the Leaf Village is filled with people who, in their pain, overcorrected themselves and singled them out in the opposite way. The pain of Naruto wasn't any one person's fault, it was the fault of a village. Each person shared in the responsibility of what produced Naruto. Rather than create an environment where he could feel loved and appreciated, everyone ostracized him completely. You can't just point the finger at Hiruzen or Kakashi or Jiraiya, you have to point the finger at everyone. Yeah, some people have direct connections to Naruto's father, but to put the blame on any one person misses the point. They all should have done something about it, but nobody did. It's just like how in a real life emergency, people tend not to call for help because they assume someone else will. And that's why Naruto is who he is. Growing up in a world where nobody extended a hand to him, he became that person. Someone who no matter how difficult or how much he would have to sacrifice to do so, would extend a hand to help people. But that's a massive topic in itself. I seriously don't know how people can miss this. I mean, the biggest plot hole in Naruto? The biggest I can't- Hello? Hey, what's going on, man? I, I can't I can't do this anymore. I, I if if the Hokage thing makes me this angry, how am I going to be able to do stuff like Naruto's Destiny or Obito's Redemption? I, I can't finish this anymore. I understand how you're feeling, but this needs to get done. Yeah, but you don't understand. It's just yo, you got no choice. You have to do this, man. Are are you? The first time I saw the Search for Sonata arc, I remember absolutely loving the role the Akatsuki played, and I still feel the exact same way. Here's why. Even though Naruto is the main character and namesake of the series, a majority of the characters up to this point were focused far more on Sasuke. All the girls they grew up with loved Sasuke. They basically got equal shine during the Land of Waves, but then as soon as we got back to the exams, it was right back to Sasuke. Lee wanted to fight Sasuke, Gara wanted to fight Sasuke, Neji wanted to fight Sasuke, Rochumaru was after Sasuke, Kakashi gave Sasuke special training, etc. And so when the Akatsuki appear, and one of them is Itachi, Sasuke's literal brother and goal in life, it looks like it's going to be yet another group after Sasuke. But then Itachi's like, get the heck out of my face bro, I'm looking for Naruto. It may be a small thing, but it's a great addition to the arc as we're finally getting the Naruto focus he deserves. To be fair, there was a point to emphasizing Sasuke repeatedly, but that's kind of what the next arc is about, so let's talk about it then. It's hard to think that there was a time when Naruto didn't have his now iconic Rasengan, but here it is. I know it's not exactly unique to have the main protagonist's signature move be far more simple than a majority of the cast, but you know what, I don't care, because it works. The Rasengan is one of the coolest little moves ever. A lot of the attacks in Naruto grow to be these super flashy, grand moves, but there's something great about the simplicity of the Rasengan. And as long as we're talking about the powers of the series, can we talk about how freaking cool of an idea the hand signs are? Yes, I tried to learn how to do them when I was a kid just like the rest of you. It's such a unique little thing that's so recognizable to the series of Naruto. It's one of those things that's obvious to us now, but you gotta wonder what was going through Kishimoto's mind when he thought of them. The older I get, the more I've come to appreciate Tsunade as a character. 
When I was a kid, I hated her because I wanted Naruto to become Hokage instead of her. I understand that Naruto was just a kid and of course that wouldn't have worked, but I'll let my younger self dream. These days I would argue that Tsunade is perhaps the best written character in the whole female cast of Naruto. I still wouldn't call her my favorite as that spot is reserved for the one and only, but whatever, Tsunade's great. One thing I really love about this arc is how elegantly Tsunade was woven into the story. For a while we've known about the legendary three Sanin, and Tsunade has both been name dropped and shown during the Chunin exams, so it's no surprise that she exists in this world. But on top of that, the whole story was set up in a way that pointed to her. If three legendary ninja exist, and one of them is currently trying to assault the village, obviously one of the other ones should fill the empty seat of Hokage. And since Jiraiya is… Jiraiya, it can't be him. But since he knows her well, he is a great candidate to convince her to fill that seat. On the other hand, since Orochimaru also knows her well, he is also seeking her out because she's the greatest healer in the world and he just lost his arms. Basically, all eyes are on this mystery woman Tsunade, so when we meet her, her inclusion in the story makes perfect sense. Rather than be a random third party that shows up conveniently to be Hokage, she's a natural extension of the entire story that's played out thus far. She's such a great character from the setup. Like many other characters, she is burdened by pain and loss from her past. And she's forced to choose between what she wants and what's right. I've always personally been a sucker for when characters are forced to make decisions like these, so starting her story off in this way makes her instantly likable for me. The three-way deadlock between the Sanin has always been such a great fight. Not only is this the highest level battle that's been shown in the series thus far, but as to be expected at this point, Kishimoto wove an incredibly moving, emotional story to go along with it. There's so many good quotes from this battle, but the best is made by Jiraiya when he reveals that the most important skill for a ninja is the guts to never give up, which becomes Naruto's iconic ninja way. On a side note, there's something so visceral about being stabbed in the hand. This scene has always grossed me out in the best way possible. But all of the artwork during the manga version of this fight is just top tier. Look at how gentle and subtle this sequence of Sanade tearing up is. Contrasting that to the graphic panels of Sanade overcoming her fear of blood makes it all the more intense. The final arc of the first series starts with something every Naruto fan has wanted to see. Naruto vs Sasuke. Kishimoto masterfully built up to this by constantly comparing these two characters while never giving us definitive answers. Each time one got stronger, so did the other. They learned the basics together. When Naruto got the Ninetale Cloak, Sasuke got the Curse Mark. When Sasuke got Chidori, Naruto got the Rasengan. The whole time we knew they would eventually clash with each other. The only question was, who was stronger? And of course we still don't definitively find out here. But Sasuke leaves the village, and the chase is on. Oh, what am I kidding? You thought I wouldn't mention it? Yes, Lee and Guy's conversation about the operation both breaks my heart and warms it at the same time. I can't even explain to you the amount of love I have for these two beautiful boys, so I'll just move on. I think that the iconic promise Naruto makes to Sakura is pretty touching, all things considered. Though, it would have been great to see her accompany Naruto on the journey, but I can understand why she wouldn't. Sakura started out totally hating Naruto, so seeing her humble herself to the point where she would ask such a thing is really vulnerable, and I appreciate giving Naruto the extra motivation going into the arc. And now I can talk about how insanely hype this arc is, oh my gosh! Maybe a controversial opinion, but this is my favorite arc of the first series. Yes, it's better than the Chunin exams. The whole structure of the arc just lends itself to epic storytelling. One group versus another, all splitting up and putting their faith that the rest of the group will accomplish their mission, eventually whittling down to just one. And it's all framed around a deeply emotional rescue mission for a friend in need. It's an arc that pays off so many of the relationships and setups that have been created in the starting arcs. It's a story that feels like its own climax of the story while setting up new potential and foreshadowing for the story at large, ending with the best and most heartfelt battle in the series thus far. I could go forever breaking down the specifics but I literally just can't or this video would be twice as long. Choji becoming a butterfly, Neji sacrificing taking the arrow to the gut, 
Shikamaru overcoming the Genjutsu, Kiba and Akamaru's epic struggle against Sakan, the artwork, the designs, the animation, themes of power, manipulation, struggle, ninja just being tools, friendship, loss, and more. Each character is pushed to their absolute limits and still continue on. Rock Lee's hilarious drunken fist, Kimimaru's character, Gara's epic entrance and redemption, it's all great and it's all delivered with both a style and heart that feel unique to Naruto itself. But then it all comes to a head at the final valley. Like I said earlier, the number one thing that each Naruto fan wants to know at this point is whether Naruto or Sasuke is stronger, and so I can't think of a more fitting way to end part one. Literally standing in the shadows of their predecessors, there's a great thematic difference between Naruto and Sasuke. Sasuke's motivations tie him to the past, while Naruto is fighting for the present. As I said of the arc as a whole, Naruto vs Sasuke is not only perfectly choreographed, but it's a battle that serves as a climax for the relationships that have been built over the entire story. You really feel the tension of two brothers, destined to walk on different paths, fighting against each other but also for each other. Seeing Sasuke's full backstory here adds a great amount of fuel to the battle. It sets up Itachi as one of the greatest villains ever, while also making Sasuke's motivation for the fight clear. While Naruto is trying to convince Sasuke to return, Sasuke feels he has to kill Naruto in order to awaken his Mangekyo Sharingan. And after that, the fight just plays out mixing in a handful of flashbacks as well as meaningful dialogue. The two brothers just fight it out with a nearly poetic ending. And I'd like to talk about how actually wild of a decision it is to have Sasuke leave the Leaf Village. I think that the Kurapika inspiration can definitely be seen here, as Kurapika also ends up leaving the group, but where I think that Kishimoto took this idea even further is just how much of an integral character he was before he left. Sasuke is the secondary main character of the show, and Naruto's best friend. Yeah, there were rivals who would clash at times, but though there was a constant wedge growing between them, they were also constantly growing as friends. So yeah, a conflict was definitely inevitable, but who would have expected him to actually leave for good? Naruto's promise to Sakura goes unfulfilled by the end of the arc. Keep in mind that at the time, Sasuke was the third most popular character in the series, and shortly after the arc became the most popular character. This is why a majority of the first series was focusing on Sasuke, because even after fighting Naruto to near death, he's still unable to strike him down, and he walks off into the darkness for nearly the rest of the series. And as part one concludes, we get hints to where the rest of the story is headed. Naruto will continue to chase after Sasuke after training with Jiraiya. Sakura vows to get stronger so that the next time she can join Naruto in the fight, and the Akatsuki are on the move. Now that we've basically covered the story of part one, I'm going to talk about a few final points that didn't really fit anywhere else. At some point, I have to talk about the transition from manga to anime, so I think this is the best place to do it. I spoke earlier about how good I thought the manga was, and I will echo the same sentiment about the anime adaptation. In the transition from manga to anime, one thing that was generally altered was how graphic it was. While many of the same beats carried over, some of the specific acts of violence or imagery are changed or removed. For instance, in the Land of Waves, Inari's surrogate father Kaiza gets his arms broken as he hangs on the crucifix before his death. But in the manga, he actually has his arms completely cut off. However, the trade-off is some legitimately sleek animation. It doesn't always look incredible, but man, when Naruto looks good, it looks really good. They capture the elasticity and the energy of the manga with really fluid movements. They completely understood the fundamentals of animation and it shows. The way the animation takes already beautiful scenes and goes beyond into something even greater is downright impressive. I haven't mentioned it up till now, but the music for Naruto is probably my favorite for any anime series. Credit is due to both the composer for the original series as well as the composer for Shippuden, Toshio Masuda and Yasuharu Takanashi respectively. Both of them do such an amazing job at building the world and selling the emotion of these scenes. From the upbeat theme of Naruto to the emotional beats of the goodbye scene to the haunting Akatsuki theme. These are the sounds you hear when you think of Naruto, and the reason the anime made these scenes as powerful as they did. Truly speaking, a portion of the world building was done by these two men's contributions of the series, and it cannot be understated how much acknowledgement they deserve for it. 
Also, all the music for Naruto is currently on Spotify, so go listen to that again if you haven't in a while. I think it's appropriate when discussing the anime adaptation by addressing the elephant in the room. The filler. When it comes to the adaptation of a long-running weekly manga, the most prominent issue is that a well-paced episode of anime normally covers around two to four chapters of manga depending on the material. But obviously this presents a problem. When you come out with one chapter a week, as well as one episode a week that covers three manga chapters, the anime inevitably catches up to the manga very quickly. So the problem for any long-running anime is, how do you buy time for the manga to get farther ahead? There are basically three solutions to this issue. The most commonly used with newer series is to make the anime seasonal. That way, for a few months of the year the manga can continue to move forward. We can see this format being used phenomenally by Jujutsu Kaisen, My Hero Academia, or Attack on Titan. However, with strictly weekly shows there are two remaining solutions. The first is to slow the pacing down and adapt less and less manga per episode. An example of this can be seen with something like the One Piece anime, where after the time skip the anime started to adapt about one chapter per episode and sometimes even less than that. This snail's pace of an adaptation can make it where there are episodes in which nothing happens but you technically can't skip the episodes because they're canon. The other option of course is to add filler episodes, and I would like to make a brief clarification about what kind of filler I'm talking about. The way I see it there are two types of filler filler that furthers the mangaka's vision, and filler that's just filler. For example, in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5 Golden Wind, there's this stupid six panel long gag of these characters dancing, and the anime completely transformed it into a full minute long music number. Or even in Naruto itself, the scene where Madara annihilates the shinobi alliance later in Shippuden is pretty much made up of content separate from the manga. This kind of filler is undebatedly welcome but then we get into filler filler. Full episodes completely disconnected from the canon that exists only to buy time for the manga to get ahead. This is the direction that the Naruto anime took. While this makes watching a series like Naruto weekly kind of a pain, it means that on a binge through it's incredible because you can literally just skip all the filler episodes. There are numerous websites that can help you navigate which sections to watch and which sections to skip, meaning that the first series goes from 220 episodes down to 130 and Shippuden goes from 500 episodes to about 295 episodes. So in total, instead of 720 episodes, the Naruto series goes all the way down to 425 episodes. But as long as we're talking about the filler episodes, I might as well say that I don't regret watching most of them. I think I started skipping the filler sometime around the pain fight, but before that I watched all of it. I mean, don't get me wrong, some of these fillers are completely insane. They spend a bunch of episodes looking for bugs, I think Rock Lee dies in one of these episodes and is brought back to life by eating curry, Naruto pees on this noble's head while Eno is dressed up like a princess, and there's like a million different ultimate weapons that are created that are never brought up again. But that being said, oh my gosh they're a lot of fun at times. Watching these episodes are obviously optional, but some of my favorite aspects of early Naruto was when the characters just goofed around in the leaf village and went on missions, and that's most of what filler is. I'm not exactly making the case that you should watch them, but if you got a lot of extra time, maybe check a few of them out. But back to the canon of the story, I think I should acknowledge how well structured Naruto as a series is up to this point. In many other anime the characters will often hit a kind of reset point between arcs, but this kind of thing doesn't happen in the Naruto first series. There's a really clear through line in all the arcs that makes everything super easy to follow. I spoke about this in a previous video, but I'll summarize it here as well. Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura meet each other and become an official team with Kakashi. They go on their first mission to the Land of Waves, and afterwards, because they've somewhat proven their capabilities, they take the Chunin exams where they train a bunch, meet a bunch of new friends, and meet Orochimaru. The Chunin exams end with an invasion of the Leaf Village where Orochimaru loses his arms and the third Okage dies. Because the third Okage is no longer around and seeing a massive loss in power in the village, the Akatsuki briefly invade looking for Naruto, and they hospitalize both Sasuke and Kakashi. Because of this, Jiraiya protects Naruto while they search for a new Hokage, and this new Hokage candidate they're looking for has ties to both Jiraiya and Orochimaru, who is also seeking her out to heal his arms. This results in a three-way battle with Tsunade returning to the village as Hokage, however when they get back Sasuke leaves the village in order to join hands with Orochimaru to get even more power. 
everything is so interconnected. Every action has a reaction. Every choice has a consequence. And I think that's pretty awesome. The Naruto Fair series is both incredibly fun at times as well as incredibly dark at times. It's an amazing first look into the world of Ninja that would be expanded upon later. Overall, I think that most people would agree that the first series is pretty darn good. It's not really till Shippuden that we get the more controversial opinions. And we will start that discussion next time, so please join me for the next segment of this series, coming... hopefully soon. Like I said, Shippuden is a lot more controversial than the first series, but spoiler warning, I like it better. But regardless of whether you like Shippuden or the first series better, either way, I'll see y'all in part two. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys later. <sighs> Hello? Hey, did you finish it? Yeah, I just finished editing it. What? Yeah, that's good. Now start on part two. You know, to be honest, I mean, it took me a while to make this, so I'm probably going to be taking a break. Wait, 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 wait. Who is this? Oh! <gasps>